room into a state of mind known as Stimulus Dimension. I'm a resident of the realm and your host, Danell Young. This entity delves into the source of environmental ills we are faced with in the black community and the world abroad, while bearing the vendetta of restoring the integrity of hip hop culture and quality of radio listening as a whole. A coming, watch and listen as we are both enlightened with a true learning experience. The cycle, a perpetual spiral around timelines. With each spin over airwaves, wheels made of steel transmit signals universally. Shrouded in mystery is he who is conductor behind the chosen wheel. Or perhaps the wheel chose him. And the beat lives on. Hello and welcome to Stimulus Dimension. Today's topic is entitled Wheels Made of Steel with DJ Lopes. I'm your host, Danielle Young, alias Nails Uh Before we get started, Lopes, uh, thank you for coming on the show. Um, Oh, I really appreciate it, man. But uh, tell everybody your job title and what you like to do for fun. Uh, okay. Um, my name is DJ Lopes. Uh, recognized here in Detroit as a Detroit hip hop pioneer. Uh, I'm the son of the world renowned percussionist Carl Bush Small. Um, we played percussion for Parliament Funkadelic and many other, other acts. Um, but my role is, is DJ and a producer of uh, many hip hop acts here. Uh, I had the first rap album from Detroit uh, with my partner EC Reed back in 1988. So I'm revered as somewhat of a legend, but I prefer Pioneer. Well, that's good stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna get into my first question for you folks. Uh, time travels. In its inception, the wheel was designed for commuting through time at a faster pace. The horse and chariot, bicycles, cars, and motorcycles all have this device built into them, enabling us to reach destinations at different intervals. A record placed onto a turntable. The needle is dropped onto the surface as it begins to spin in a circular motion, becoming a wheel all the same. Now fully in gear, the listener is driven towards any kind of emotional high they desire. Over the decades, where do you believe music has jittened society mentally, and where will it lead us in the future? Where has it, where has it gotten us now in today's time? Yeah, and you know, pretty much over the years, um, over the decades. Music has been a, a vehicle for emotion since its creation, and it's it's a mood music is a mood so it's it's been up it's, it can uplift you to, it's taken us through slavery you know and it's comforted us um it unifies us i mean music is <laughs> it, it's there's so many facets to it but more more so than anything, it's a mood and it can it can make you happy, it can make you sad, you know what I'm saying? It can inform you. Um, you know, I don't know where I would be without music. I hear that. Uh, my second question. Can't hear nothing but the music I'm slipping. A quote from the duo EPMD is suggestive of effects a concoction of music and the human brain has on mood and an atmosphere. Experts have scientifically asserted certain musical frequencies emphasize on areas of the brain causing aggression or undesirable behavior. As a DJ, have you seen any firsthand evidence this cause and effect ideology is true? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, sounds and tones, like I said, music is a, is a mood. So there are certain songs that I've played as a DJ that incited fights before. I've seen people be angry and aggressive, you know. Uh, this is a long time ago. I, I try to steer away from tracks like that now, but but I did learn that. Um, I've seen people, like a lot of people like to dance more so than anything, of course. Yeah. So 
the music that has the energy to that's very rhythmic and and, and up tempo it brings a, a certain uh brightness to the to the room and uh i see more people gravitate to the dance floor when i play music that way and because you know there's always the few people that come to the party looking for a fight that's true but <laughs> there, there are certain songs like i, I just saw some so i interviewed uh with a group and they were saying how there was a song they had called Terry Club, but I won't mention their name, but you know, the hip hop artists know who they are. Yeah. And um, um, they actually used to literally tear the club up <laughs> after when the song came on. That song, and uh, there was another uh, act that said, um, was asking, what hood are you from or whatever, and there's so many different areas and hoods and middle boroughs. And, uh, yeah, so that would also incite uh, aggression and, and tension in the room amongst the diversity of uh, neighborhoods. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you try to steer away from stuff like that. When you, 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 as a DJ, you analyze the diversity of the room and see who's in there, you know, what type of individuals and personalities are there. And you try, me personally, I try not to go that route because I know where it's going to end up. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next question. Let us take a spin from the wheel in search of the letter Q. While the record is being scratched and mixed upon, it starts going round producing the requested letter. DJ, I'd like to bite the vowel U. With a scratch and cut, this letter is granted as well. Now solving the puzzle, the word in question is quality. For over a decade, consumers and critics alike all say overall quality of the hip hop genre played on commercial radio has been unsatisfactory. It is said to disappointingly lack in powerful sentiment, lyrical craftiness, and beat wise. How can enthusiasts salvage the art and regain its potency? Um, in my opinion, the youth has always run the music industry. I learned that from my father. And um, I, I confirmed it by looking at the different eras. It's always been a youth. It's never been a time where the older generation dictated record sales and popularity. It's always been. It's always changing. So it's always been. You know, during, during the time of Motown, you know, we're here in Detroit, Michigan. You know, this is the Motown city. Um, Motown is all young people. You know what I'm saying? There's no older people. You know, they, they're older now, but the youth is always running. Now, me being in hip hop and being one of the first here in Detroit, of course, I've noticed the change and I've noticed the lack of substance in the music and the lack of creativity when it comes to the lyrics. Um, that is a skill that has to be developed with somebody who has passion for that. And unfortunately, a lot of the youth don't have a passion for that. What their passion is now, the fun, the moment, you know, living in the moment. And I don't have a problem with that as a DJ. I understand it. It's not the type of music that I would like to spin, but if I'm in that setting and, and it's a lot of young people here, that's what they're gonna get. They're gonna get what they want, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna sprinkle my error in there Educate. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. To educate them and to bring them across because every time I do that, I plant a seed, you know. But um, as far as uh, making them or not liking what they do and just, you know, feeding into the division between the old and the new, it, it'll never work. It'll never work. Um, the on very spiritual scriptures say, that you're not supposed to disregard the old. It, it will open your eyes to the new. So I take that as you mix the two together. You know what I'm saying? The new is supposed to be appreciated, but never forget the old. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because the old is the foundation. That's why you respect your elders. You know what I'm saying? Your elders have the wisdom, you know? So if we get enough of the youth to understand that aspect, then they'll gravitate toward some of the stuff that we like and we feel is important about hip hop. And that's what spawned the birth of this show. I was, you know, disappointed myself mm -hmm. with the overall quality 
of stuff played on the radio. So I said, you know, I want to educate them on how it's supposed to actually sound, or actually, I'm not going to say supposed to, but the grassroots, right. you know, the basic exactly. format. And it, as long as you approach it that way, you'll get some listeners, you'll get some, you'll plant some seeds, and you'll get some people that are surprised you, some young people that know, that I know young people that all they listen to is our era of music. Mm-hmm. And it surprises me, you know, they come up to me and they'll know lyrics from my album. Oh, wow. And recite them to me. And I'm like, man, I wrote that when I was 15 years old. I'll be 48 in a couple of days, I'm a couple of months. You know what I'm saying? So you know that? And I'm like, man, I don't listen to nothing but old school hip hop. So um, that, that brings a smile to my face when I run into people like that. And it's, it's, a, it's a few of them that appreciate us. And that's what it's said for me. Yeah. I think I was, I might have been eight when you dropped that first album. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, wow. that's what it's said for yeah, me. 15 years old for me. Yeah. Okay, my next question. The opposite, <clears throat> the opposite of the foreground is the underground. Innumerable amounts of artists only scratch one of these two surfaces. What are some advantages and disadvantages of having worldwide acclaim or being celebrated in smaller capacities as a musician? Um, a benefit to me being underground is that the people who actually appreciate that art form are underground listeners. And those are the people that I've always wanted to accept me. It's the people who really know art and really appreciate what it is that I can do when I'm on the turntables or when I'm I produce a track and say, oh man, that track is hot man, you know, how did you do that? I didn't even I never thought to make that or you know, you took this old record and you spliced it with this other record and I can hear it in there but it doesn't sound like the old record and that's just creative, you know what I'm saying? So um those are always been the people uh, outside of my own parents because you always look for validation from your parents and I, I do you know what I'm saying I'm honest with you. you know my dad being a musician I've always went to him and played music for him to see what he thought yeah. you know what I'm saying him being a seasoned official musician and um, that's always been somebody that uh, I would you know I, I care what he thinks yeah. um, but his era is different from my era too. So, not all, he, would, he, he wouldn't be one that I, if he didn't appreciate what I did, it wouldn't, it wouldn't stop me. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I was tell myself, okay, he has his era. He comes from the disco and funk era. So he's gonna look at what we do as a little bit crude or not, it's gonna be subpar in his mind. You know what I'm saying? And I understand that. But that doesn't mean it's not going to be successful or it's not going to be appreciated by those people in the underground. Yeah. Now, as um, uh, far as um, being a um, uh, commercial success, I mean, those are obvious uh, uh, benefits. You're going to get the financial benefit. You're going to get the fame. Uh, and those are the two things uh, that drive the commercial artist, fame and money. So those are the things you're gonna receive from it. But those aren't necessarily the things that I look for. Like I said, in the underground category, you get respect. You see what I'm saying? And that's most most important to me besides fame and money. Respect. Because that's a basic thing when you know when we uh, interact with one another as basic human beings, you know what I'm saying? Everybody wants respect from one another. So that's that's the real riches right there. All right. A member of the legendary hip hop collective Zulu Nation by the name of DST has cited has been cited as saying making rap records tore everything apart. That's what killed hip hop. Because the money took over and the people who had no knowledge of the culture but had better knowledge of the business aspect got control of the SHIT and messed it up, end quote. The corporate world 
has vampirized viable talents from the inner city for generations at the crossroads of dollars and cents. Do dollars truly make sense? What strategies can the rap world employ to guarantee the community receives the full benefit of translating our authentic art forms into business ventures? Um, in this society, of course, dollars would make sense because that's what, um, unfortunately, that empowers you, you know, um, to do more things. Um, if the, the least amount of capital that you have to invest in yourself, um, the less likely you're going to reach the masses um, where they can decide whether or not they like your product. So I would say, and it is ironic that you mentioned dollars and cents. My, that's a song that my dad played on by DJ Quick. Yeah, oh man. <laughs> my dad played percussion on that song. Um, but I would say, yeah, in this society, it does make sense. But should that be your driving goal for everything that you do? I, 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 I say not. You know what I'm saying? You know, but everybody has different um, opinions of what the level of success is. You know, and just because you're not the main artist on the top doesn't mean that you're not good. It just doesn't mean that because I know it's all driven. Uh, by by finance, you know what I'm saying. I know a lot of talented people who never made it to the NBA, who never made it to anything that we would consider to be a successful uh, level in life. But that, that I know their talent, and I'm like, man, that guy is good. I know that guy; he's just as good as Kobe Bryant. You know what I'm saying? So um, that would be what I would say about that. You know what I'm saying? Dollars do do make sense. But you can also you gotta be careful with that because you lose your you lose a bit of your soul. You know, one of one of my philosophies is the more you you uh the more money you have, a lot of times you detach from the source of the universe. You know what I'm saying? That's just my personal um philosophy. You know what I'm saying? Because think when you don't have when the least least amount of that you have, that's when you work with the most faith. You know what I'm saying? Oh, and humbleness. And humbleness. Yeah. You know, and that's how hip hop was born. We didn't we, we weren't musicians. We didn't we didn't have instruments or anything. That's why we grabbed the timetable and we took the records in our parents' hand and we like, we're gonna make this be an instrument. And we're gonna scratch. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna extend the record, we're gonna buy two copies of the same record and the, the instrumental part, we're gonna make it last longer by playing it over here and then playing it over here again and playing over here. The rappers can rap over top of it. It's not long enough on one record. Can we can take that break and we'll keep going? That's that's where you get the term break dancers. Because they 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 just dance over that part of the record. Yeah, you know, so yeah, I love hip hop. I love hip hop. <laughs> yes, it came it came from little or nothing. Yeah. So yeah. Same. that shows you how talented we are. Yep. Same same principle applies with with, with money. The least. You have the the more hungry you are, and I think like a lot of artists, they leave, they they, they abandon that hunger once they get successful. You know, it's not it's not this passionate anymore. You're just doing this. It's a job. It's like you go to work every day. You go and you don't want to go, but you know you you want that paycheck at the end of the day. So you'll go and continue to go so that you can eat. You know, and or keep a consistency or maintain your uh. Your, level, your lifestyle, yeah. and I think a lot of uh, artists do that. All right, my next question. Identical twins are caused by a single embryo splitting into two soon after fertilization. Twins possess the exact same DNA as a result of being separated from the same fertilized egg. During a live performance, some onlookers perceive the DJ and the MC as being extensions of one another, merging as one, then dispersing again into two different directions, but under one common cause, to rock a crowd. Are you of the same belief, and can you further clarify what a DJ's role is in administering a complete musical experience to an audience? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Like when I perform with, with artists, you know, a lot of my, my um, 
the artists that I produce or DJ for, they were really good friends of mine. So you have to be in tune with those individuals when doing a performance. You know, um, there are times where, as a DJ, I might make a mistake. You know, you're dealing with technology, you're dealing with computers and records, and you know things happen. You know that you up there are behind your control. You know what I'm saying? Your, your uh, coordination may, may be off and all kind of stuff. So, okay. You know, um, know, knowing that, uh, you have to be in tune with the artist, and the artist has to be in tune with you. So they they have to sense when you you get something that's not going right, and they they know to oh the, the music is not you can't play the music right now let me improvise and run a freestyle for a minute until we get it back you know what I'm saying we play freestyle and it look back over me and we like maybe we're not at each other and I'm like yeah I'm ready now I wasn't ready before but I'm ready now and then we you know what I'm saying we keep it moving and the audience never notices it you know what I'm saying so at the same time I can tell when the artist doesn't know his lyrics you know or when it's not a good thing to or continue this song or whatever and I know to do something to take it up with notch and, and end the song. You know what I'm saying? Because you may have forgotten his lyrics. So it's all kind of um like nuances or uh, instances where you uh you have to be one with with the with the artist that you're performing with. I've seen that happen when I uh went to the show so I don't expect it. Yeah, you want to not try to make it uh, obvious. That's, yeah. that's the key. You know, a lot of artists don't know that. They be like, oh, come on, what's up, DJ? Yeah. You know, and you don't want to do that. It's a performance. You yeah. know. So that's for sure. Uh, so all right, my next question. An argument persisting ever since the music's birth has been commercial rap simply is a tool used for appeasing the mainstream and financial gain. Underground segments of the culture is what sustains the pureness and remains unblemished over the test of time. Can you explain what commercial and non-commercial rap sounds like? Mm. Well, to be commercial, the, the definition is in the word itself. When you watch television, in between programming, you see commercials. And what are, what is the definition of a commercial? It's advertisement or you know uh, a way to advertise something. So when there's an over abundance of advertising in your music, that's what I consider it to be commercial. Um, if you don't have a lot of substance in in your music, like you no know, stories or nothing that people can relate to, or uh, just just something that people would gravitate toward on the artsy side. You know what I'm saying? The, you know the art side is more of the underground side, and of course it's all art. Even the commercial stuff is art, but there's a uh, kind of corny side to commercialism you know what I'm saying I want to say it like that because you know the stuff that that makes it big is so simple and doesn't take a lot of thought to put it together you know what I'm saying it's just about having fun and I'm not I'm not knocking that you know what I'm saying because I like to have fun too I'm a human being we all like to have fun but some people like to have fun more so than others, and there are different levels of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my next question. What have your musical travels around the world taught you about the psychology of human beings? Well, I've run into some racism around the world. Um, but I've also run into the fact that because of the music that we're presenting or who I'm touring with, they kind of put that racism to the side. I've seen that happen too. You know, I just I went on tour with uh, Eminem and Royce 5'9". And uh, we went to Australia 
in New Zealand. And uh, we were well received, you know, for a lot of it, I think, was because we were Eminem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everybody reveres Eminem in, in high regard, and as well as Marshall. You know what I'm saying? I love Marshall. You know what I'm saying? Marshall is art wise, cannot be denied. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, but um, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, I've experienced that as far as the psychology of different people, you know, and a little bit of racism. Um, a lot of, uh, what kind of mixed vibe about being from America? You know what I'm saying? You know, they, they kind of, um, they kind of, uh, I don't know, I don't know what to say. They kind of look down on Americans a little bit. Uh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Stimulus Dimension. Have a go. You've fallen into a state of mind known as Stimulus Dimension. I'm a resident of the realm and your host, Danielle Young. This entity delves into the source of environmental ills we are faced within the black community and the world abroad while bearing the vendetta of restoring the integrity of hip-hop culture and quality of radio listening as a whole. A cometh, watch and listen as we are both enlightened with a true learning experience.